All right. Thank you very much for that introduction. Um, can you hear me? Can you see my screen? Yes, everything's perfect. <laughs> Excellent. Great. Well, thank you very much for the the invitation to be here today. It's um, it's actually awesome to see some friends here who I haven't seen in a long time, uh, some former office mates on the call as well, um, and it's just great to be back in the whole Max Planck Society world. Um, the Max Planck Society is incredibly unique and a really special place. I feel very privileged that I, I had the opportunity to be there for, for three years, and I really hold the society in, in the highest regard. So thank you um, for this opportunity today. So what I want to talk to you a bit about today is um, exactly this idea of how do we acquire our equipment and is there um, an alternative to our tradition of writing a grant or getting some internal funding, uh, writing a big check and, and having an instrument show up that slowly gets older and more obsolete as we go? And um, so this is the big question. Does, does leasing, this idea of leasing make sense for core facilities? And, I, I would say that a lot of us are very familiar with leasing in our everyday life. Um, so I know, for example, my, my cell phone, sorry, my handy, um, I paid $30 a month for the first two years and now I own it. So you can think of that as a type of lease. Um, here in North America, because we love debt much more than maybe more responsible countries around the world, uh, a lot of people are really happy to lease vehicles. So. You go and pick up your car from Ford or Volkswagen, and for three years, you write them a check. And then at the end of that three years, you take your car back and they give you a new one. Um, I think this is less apparent in the personal computer space. I know I certainly have never leased a, a laptop on my own, but um, in the corporate space, this is very common. So my desktop computer sitting next to me here every four years, it, it gets replaced as part of a lease program. Um, and definitely outside of our personal lives, leasing in the corporate space is incredibly common. Um, so all of these items that I've just talked about, cell phones, computers, vehicles, it's very common for large corporations to, to use a leasing model for acquisition of these products. But um, and even in the medical space, uh, especially in hospital settings for MRI systems, CT scans, very expensive systems like that, that are, are continually um, advancing and, and new technologies arriving. It's, this discussion has been happening there for, um, when I look back at, at the literature, it was a good five or 10 years um, prior to when we just started talking about it for, for microscopes. So, um, but I do find it strange that it's not something that's very often talked about for high-end scientific equipment. Um, most commonly, we buy these really expensive instruments and we let them sit in our facility until eventually at some point we can't find replacement parts for them anymore. Uh, and then we get rid of them. So what I want to do today is sort of investigate this question of, of does leasing make sense for core facilities? And I want to do it in this way. I want to introduce you to our facility, just real quick, give you an overview of what the Harvard Center for Biological Imaging is all about. Uh, we're housed in this building here on the right, which is the original biology building here at Harvard. Um, I'm going to give you an introduction to leasing. Leasing comes in many, many different forms. So I'm just going to give a very basic outline of, of the type of lease system that we're using here at the HCBI. Uh, tell you a bit about the advantages of leasing. Um, tell you the ins and outs of our program, which we call Evergreen. And then I'll definitely throw in a few disadvantages of leasing too, uh, which have been become very apparent in the, in the last few months. So I realized at the last minute that this talk didn't have a single microscopy image in it. So I had to throw in this slide. <laughs> um, so our facility opened a little over 10 years ago in May, 2010. Uh, our equipment is now continually renewed and refreshed via a lease program, which we call Evergreen, which I'll talk about. And our user base, we, we support a really wide range of basic science, primarily what happens on the, the main Cambridge campus here of Harvard. I'd say primarily we do a lot of large 3D tissue type imaging, um, more so than cell biology. And there's just a few examples here. So um, 
On the top left, this is an image from the Shoe Lab earlier this year. They had this incredible paper that um, linked mechanistically, uh, they were able to link stress to actual development of gray hair. Um, another group, uh, our paper out of Kate Bentley's group did some really cool um, technological development to be able to image the vasculature of intact mouse eyeballs um, in both fixed and cleared tissue as well as in living tissue. Uh, just last week, this paper, you may have seen this one, it got a lot of coverage in the popular media um, out of the Bologna lab down the hall where they um, discovered the mechanism behind the sense of taste that octopuses have uh, in their tentacles. And then we do definitely do still do some cell biology. Um, so this is uh, an image out of a paper recently from Nancy Kleckner's group that showed um, some interesting uh, biophysics on how chromosomes condense and how a lot of what was thought in the past was actually artifact from fixed tissue. And if you do this in live tissue, you, you get some different physics out of it. So that's sort of in a really quick snapshot what goes on in here. Um, and these are just a few papers out of the last year. So as far as equipment goes, I, I told you we sort of specialize in, in thick 3D tissues. So because of that, we have um, a lot of equipment on the point scanning confocal side, multi-photon side. Uh, so right now we have um, uh, LSM 980 upright with a spectrophysics insight laser. We've got two inverted 880s and an inverted 700. Uh, we also do a fair bit of high throughput imaging. So we have two Axio scan whole slide scanners. Uh, we have a cell discoverer that we can image multi-wall plates on. And then we have a few specialized or sort of niche techniques. Um, so light sheet uh, with a lot of clearing optics for, for doing large clear tissues. We have um, an Alara 7 with lattice sim and 3D single molecule localization, uh, an Axio zoom dissecting scope, and then a laser dissection system as well. Uh, so that's what's, what's in the facility right now. Uh, our user base, we see about 700 individual users a year through the facility. Um, the majority of this, over 500, is Harvard College graduate students, postdocs, faculty, and undergrads. Um, we also have uh, a large group that comes from Harvard Medical School, which in all intents and purposes is actually almost a second campus on the south side of the city. Um, and the affiliated hospitals, which are all throughout Boston. Uh, we have some external academic users, so some people from MIT and some of the other colleges in the area come over to use the facility. And as well, there's a thriving biotech industry just down the road in Kendall Square that, that uses the facility as well. So in the course of a year, this comes out, well, in, in the good times in the past, this was about 25,000 hours of imaging a year which if you put that over 365 days, it's about six hours per microscope per day. So, so it's a pretty busy place. So that's a, a snapshot of, of what the Harvard Center for Biological Imaging is. Um, so let's get into this idea of leasing. So I think probably most people are familiar with a lease, but I'm just going to define a couple terms before we start here. So. Uh, a, a lease can be thought of as a financial, traction, financial transaction between two parties. Um, so there is the lesser that's providing the product and then the lessee who is actually obtaining this product. And the leasee is gonna make some regular payments, financial payments over a set time interval to that lesser for that equipment, the use of that equipment. And then this is where things get a little more specific or can be a little different from lease to lease. There's a lot of options over who retains ownership, who gets ownership at the end of the lease um, and things like that. So um, specifically today, our lease model that we have here at the HCBI is um, exactly what you would get with a car lease. So the, the lesser, the microscope company actually retains the ownership on the microscope. And then at the end of the lease, um, the HCBI as the lessee has the choice of either purchasing the product outright and keeping it in the facility or trading it in and bringing in a new instrument to replace it. So when I'm talking about leases today, this is the model that I'm talking about. 
Um, the microscope company is always going to retain ownership. The lessee, us, the HCBI, we have the option to outright purchase at the end or, or renew with a new instrument. So this question of leasing versus buying in the corporate world um, was actually solved a long time ago. So if you go through and look at any modern business textbook, um, they all come back to this paper from 1976. And because this is a microscopy talk, it always has to involve a Nobel laureate. So Merton, uh, Merton Miller here was actually a Nobel Prize winner in economics. And he and Charles Up Upton published this paper in 1976. And they came up with six situations where leasing is advantageous over buying. So what I'd like to do for the next few minutes is just kind of walk through these six situations um, and see if I can convince you that they are advantageous when you're talking about microscopes as well. So the first question I always get when someone says, oh, that's interesting that you lease your microscopes instead of buying them, that must be cheaper, right? Please, please tell me it's cheaper. Well, if you go back and read Merton, uh, Merton and Upton's paper, they'll tell you that, no, it's not cheaper. Um, if it was cheaper, everybody would do it. Um, but it should also mean that it's not more expensive. Um, so if I still remember my introduction to economics lecture from back in my undergrad days, uh, they always, economists always like to talk about this invisible hand. And the invisible hand says that if one thing is cheaper than another, everyone moves that way until the out of their option comes down in price. So no, leasing is not advantageous, but I will give um, one little asterisk beside this. Uh, it does get a little more complicated if you pay taxes. Um, thankfully in academia, most of us are all tax-free entities, so we don't have to worry about this. Um, although there can be tax advantages or disadvantages to the corporation that is leasing you the instruments. Um, so, but that's something for, for them to dig into. Uh, the other thing that I wanna stay away from taxes is uh, at least here in America, tax laws change every four years and I'm sure they will be next year. Um, so it's also really difficult to sort of keep on top of this. So here are the other six main advantages that Miller and Upton talked about. Um, so first is the rate of technological improvement, um, the consideration of maintenance, maintenance expenditures, consideration of end of life disposal costs, um, thinking about risk and how much risk you're willing to take on with your equipment, uh, thinking about adaptability, and then budgeting. And number five and number six, I'll be honest, the, I took a little liberty with those. That's more of my thinking, but definitely the first four, you can find these embedded in, in that paper that I referenced earlier. So let's take a look at each of these. Um, so if we look at the rate of technological improvement in the, the 10 years that the HCBI has been here, um, we started out with a 700 series confocal, we moved into 800 series confocals, and now we've just installed our first 900 series confocal. Obviously I'm being very Zeiss centric, um, but just to be fair here, let's look at the other German microscopy company. And you can see there's been a similar product development over the last 10 years there, going from the SP5 to the SP8 to now the Stellaris system. So if each of these new models enables some sort of new, fast, or better science, we can think that a scientist who is rapidly refreshing their equipment should have an advantage over one who is not. I mean, there's a lot to debate there, whether the technological breakthroughs from the 700 series to the 800 series were all that dramatic. Um, but just in general, you can think that the scientist who keeps their equipment refreshed and new um, probably has some sort of advantage over someone who's using something that's 10 years old. It's also important to consider um, this, what's termed the expected period of asset use. So just because a microscope can um, run for 10 years, uh, I remember when I was at the, the Max Planck in um, Göttingen, I'd often use the SP2 because it was always available and no one was on it, whereas the SP5 was, was very difficult to get time on. Um, 
So you, you have to also consider that although something may be used for 10 years, do you really want to use it for 10 years? Um, and this really comes into play if you have competing facilities in your neighborhood. So for example, over at the med school side of campus, there are a ton of microscopy facilities. And um, if one of those facilities has the newest, best equipment, um, some of the other facilities might lose some of their user base to that uh, place and run into some financial problems. So it's always important to consider this idea that just because a microscope can last for 10 years, um, do you necessarily need to be using it for, or will it be in high demand for those 10 years? Probably not. Um, I know a lot of us as core managers struggle with this idea of whether or not we need a service contract. Service contracts are really expensive. They can eat up your budget pretty quickly, um, but so can uh, a dramatic failure um, in, in part of your system. So I know we all debate whether these service contracts are worthwhile or not, um, but in a lease system, I think this is one of the biggest advantages to leasing is you don't have to have this debate anymore, especially in the system that we have where the microscope manufacturer maintains ownership of the system. That means that they're responsible for making sure that it still works because they own it. Um, so we don't have to take out a service contract on top of our lease fees. Uh, it also means that that microscope company wants to maintain that system in absolute peak condition because when you trade it in in three years, they're going to try and resell it. And these people, the, the microscope companies can actually make a fair amount of money on this if they have your lease fees over three years and then they resell that instrument at the end. It's possible that they end up making more money off of it than in the, if they had have just sold it as a single system to begin with. So this puts the onus on them um, to maintain that system in, in peak condition. Also, if that system breaks down and is unusable for a long period of time, maybe there's a, a part that's back ordered or it's just they can't get a hold of that part to fix your system, you may actually be able to lease or, or pause your lease payments. So during that time, you're actually saving some money on your core facility because while well, the instrument is, is not usable. So although it's not optimal that like, like you can't use it, it makes you feel a little bit better that like you're not paying for it. Um, another thing that I don't think we consider very often as core managers, but um, let's say some administrative people at our institutes higher up have to deal with all the time is end of life disposal of um, equipment that's used for biological research. And this can actually get pretty expensive. Um, and there's two reasons for that. Some of it is there, there's a lot of electronic equipment there and that there can be penalties depending on your jurisdiction to dispose of that. And as well, um, the mic microscopes are usually considered um, potentially contaminated by biological um, hazards. And so that means you have to go through some sort of decontamination process. Uh, so all of this can actually cost your institute a fair amount of money. So with a lease-based system, you just um, the company comes, packs up the microscope, and the onus is on them to, to do that end-of-life disposal or to transition it to another um, institute. And I'd say right now there's really not a robust used microscope resale marketplace. Um, there's uh, a couple of companies that have popped up in the area here recently in the last couple of years that seem to be doing a decent job of this. Um, but for most of us, it's we post an ad on the confocal listserv and say, hey, does anybody want this old system for parts? And then you go through this horrific process of trying to figure out how to ship it and, and how to actually do a sale transaction if, if you're asking for money for it. And it can be a, a very time consuming process as well as the expense of it. So I think this is another advantage to, to leasing. Um, risk. So all of these four things that we've just talked about, technological obsolescence, competition risk, um, cost of maintenance and repair, and end-of-life disposal costs, these are all risks to your core facility. And the proportion of this risk that is borne by you, the end user in the facility, increases the longer that instrument is in your possession. And so if you purchase that system, and you own that system and you're gonna use that system until it's end of life, 
you're at high risk of some big costs across all four of these categories. So one nice thing about leasing is the quicker your refresh rate is during your lease, the less risk you bear in all of these categories and you transfer that risk back to um, the company that is actually leasing you the equipment. So in general, leasing can be less risky. And now the, the last two are, are a couple of things that I've found have been very useful in our facility. So one is adaptability. So I wanna give you three concrete examples of what's happened here. So the first example is one of the initial systems that we had on lease was just an upright wide field fluorescence microscope. It had a stage that could hold three microscope slides at the, or sorry, eight microscope slides at a time. It was used primarily for array tomography. It was really difficult to use. Focus mapping was really, um, really tough. And it only held eight slides at a time, which wasn't nearly enough for what most of our users wanted to do. That was the least used microscope in our system. It basically sat in the back corner collecting dust. When the lease came up for that system, it was right around the time when Zeiss released the Axio scan. Um, and so we talked to the one or two people that were actually using that microscope and said, would you be interested in this product instead? Um, they said, certainly, we demoed it with them. They were pretty impressed with it. And so we were able to transition that system into an Axio scan. That Axio scan quickly became the most used piece of equipment in our facility. We now had to install a second one. We actually have a third one on the way. Um, so this enabled a whole new area of science um, that maybe couldn't have happened in the past if we had just purchased that upright system and had to wait a lot longer to get the justification to replace it. Um, similarly to this, um, I showed you that our user base in the facility has grown over the last few years. Uh, to um, be able to keep up with that, we needed to expand uh, our capacity for point scanning confocal. So originally we had one inverted system, one upright system. Um, we actually expanded to four at one point, so two inverteds, two uprights. Um, and that we were able to do that. It was a very low cost to expand that capacity because we were just adding um, an additional lease payment as opposed to trying to come up with $500,000, $800,000 for a brand new confocal. Um, uh, conversely to that, in the last few months, we've obviously had a very large decrease in the amount of usage required in the facility. Um, so we were actually able to, one of those um, upright confocals, the lease was just ending in the spring and we actually returned it um, and didn't renew that system. And so that uh, allowed us to get a little bit of budget relief um, over the last few months, which has been helpful. So that sort of leads into to budgeting. And I know I've there's a lot of core managers who have come to me and said, I really want to do a lease-based procurement in my core facility. How do I convince the administration to do this? And um, I've seen them fail at this many, many times over and over again. And for some reason, a lot of administrations just, I don't know what it is, if it's the, I think it's mainly the long-term commitment aspect of it, that you have to say, yes, we're gonna provide this money for three years or five years um, over the course of that lease. But to me, this argument right here should be exactly what every financial administrator wants. If you think about the model right now, the purchase model, we throw out all kinds of money in year one, and then we pay a little bit of money every year after that for our service contract. And then at some point, we have to throw out all kinds of money again to buy another microscope. Maybe you're lucky enough you can trade in the old one and get a bit of a discount. But still, you're going through this horrific cycle of peaks and valleys in your expenditures from your facility. Whereas with leases, you just have this consistent budget item year after year. You know exactly what it's going to be. It never goes up. It never goes down. And to me, this is what every conservative budget desires. It's just uh, a knowledge that you're going to have a consistent cost year after year. So that's my argument to, to the financial administrators out there. Um, obviously, it, it hasn't caught on because there aren't a lot of these <laughs> evergreen um, facilities out there around the world. 
but to me, it, it, it makes perfect sense. So what does this evergreen program look like at the HCBI? Uh, so I showed you this um, slide earlier, all of the equipment that's currently in the facility. Uh, all of these systems, except for the LSM 700 and the, the Palm laser dissection system are currently on lease. Um, it started out in 2010 with just three systems on lease. Uh, this was sort of by design. We didn't want to bring in all six systems in the first year and then have to continually always be replacing six systems every three years. We tried to stagger it. Um, so in the second year in 2011, another three systems came online. And that's what we were at. We were six systems for a while. And then as you saw earlier, the usership in the facility really took off. Um, once word got out that we existed and sort of the 2014, 2015, and, uh, timeline. And then after that, we've sort of been increasing um, our capacity uh, over the years. So right now we're sitting at nine lease systems. Um, I had originally projected we were going to go to 12 this year. And um, obviously COVID happens, but I'm happy to say that we will be at 12 systems uh, by January. We're actually opening a second site uh, in the new engineering building across the river, and they've decided to go with a, a lease-based system there as well. Um, so we'll be up to 12 lease systems uh, by 2021. So I, I told you earlier that leasing isn't cheaper and uh, unless you pay taxes. The, the other thing, it can be fractionally cheaper if you shorten that lease re refresh rate. So I think this is one of the most difficult things in, in starting a leasing program is deciding what the actual best rate of replacement should be. And so if you take a look, um, summing the costs over 10 years of purchases versus leases. Um, so as we said before, our lease cost um, is always pretty consistent. So let's just set that to $1. If we look at over 10 years, the cost of purchasing an instrument and replacing it every five years, this is cheaper than leasing. Um, so at long refresh rates, uh, purchases are cheaper than leasing. At about four years, this is approximately equal. And then when you get into less than four years, leasing actually does have a slight cost advantage. Um, so in our facility, we actually do a three-year refresh rate. So our contract says we can't replace a microscope um, prior to 24 months. So um, not less than, it has to be in the facility for at least two years. Uh, and it also says that Zeiss has to replace it within three years. Um, and I showed you this diagram earlier of the sort of timeline of various confocal microscope progression over the year. And you can see that three years actually matches pretty closely to this progression. And I know when I first came here to Harvard, I thought three years sounds ridiculous. There's no reason that you need to replace a microscope that often. Um, in the eight years that I've been here, we've replaced somewhere between 20 and 30 microscopes. And there have only been two microscopes in, those, uh, in all of those that I say were essentially identical to the one they, that they replaced. Um, so there is always some sort of um, new camera, new detector, um, whole new microscope redesign. Um, so I really do think that this, this three-year refresh rate is, is pretty ideal for light microscopy. If you are entering into one of these leasing um, agreements, there's a lot of freedom to them. And I think we didn't um, I never would have appreciated this to begin with. So the initial negotiations and the ongoing renegotiations that are going to happen over the course of one of these agreements um, allow you to really change things and, and tailor it to your specific program. Uh, these are three things that, that we negotiated. Um, some of them were done at the beginning. Some of them have been done during the course uh, of our Evergreen program. I think these are three of the best nego negotiations that we had. Um, so the first one was, I said, obviously the service contracts included in the lease because Zeiss owns the equipment. Um, so you don't have to worry about service contract payments. However, there are a lot of third party 
components on a microscope. There are cameras that that microscope company, they belong to Hamamatsu, they belong to Photometrics, they don't belong to the, um, they aren't manufactured by the, the microscope company, um, lasers on two photon systems. Uh, so we were able to get all of those components um, covered in the lease. So if the spectrophysics laser on our two photon dies, that's not our responsibility to replace that. It's not our responsibility to carry um, a service contract on that laser. So I think that was a really important one. Um, the other thing that we got in the lease agreement was um, we actually have an embedded site specialist on our site. Um, so Christian Hellrigel, he actually um, came to us from Jena, Germany. So some of you may actually know him, may have dealt with him in the past. Um, he is now embedded here in the HCBI and has been for the last couple of years. There's been three or four other ZEISS people have come through the facility before him. And so we have um, someone who's a link right back to um, the Germany HQ for uh, R&D um, questions that we might have or suggestions that we might have, as well as on-site support for our people. It's someone who knows the software inside and out. So that was um, a, a really excellent addition. Um, it also saves us a salary on another person. And uh, if your institute is anything like mine, it's next to impossible to create new positions. Uh, so this has been very helpful. And finally, the, the third thing that we um, negotiated were incentives. Um, so what this means is the more equipment that we add, the lower our lease fees become. So um, doesn't mean we pay less money overall, it just means the percentage um, or the cost of our lease per microscope decreases. Uh, so we had incentives for, uh, it's just based on the purchase price of the equipment that's in the facility. So we sort of had these every million dollars um, of equipment that we get in the facility, which sounds big to begin with, but when some of these systems are almost a million dollars and above themselves, uh, you can reach these um, incentive barriers pretty quickly. So what are the disadvantages? Well, I'd say the biggest disadvantage uh, became very apparent in this, this last year. So I told you earlier on that adaptability slide that you can increase and decrease your equipment levels um, based on usership and demand. Unfortunately, that's not instantaneous. We were very fortunate that we had one of our confocals that its lease was ending right during the COVID um, period, and we were able to get rid of that. If that timing hadn't have worked out, we couldn't have done that. And so I showed you this graph of our total imaging hours over the last few years, nicely increasing year after year. What I didn't show you was the numbers from this year. Um, this is where we're at this year. So the green bars hours that we've had so far and the orange bar is what I'm sort of projecting we'll have by the end of the year. Our facility was shut down from the middle of March until the beginning of July. So we had two and a half months with absolutely no revenue and we still had to make lease payments during that time. Um, so that was obviously a huge hit to our budget um, and our budget contrasts very dramatically to other core facilities on campus who don't lease their equipment. Um, so that certainly was uh, seen by finance, um, the, the administration and, and duly noted, but thankfully they've been very supportive of us because they, they feel the advantages in the long run are, are worth the hit that we're taking this year. Another one that I'm always asked about is what happens when you transition instruments? Does that affect the reproducibility of experiments? And I think this is a very valid question. Um, though one thing that I will say is most of our turnovers are very um, consistent. Uh, we turn over a 780 confocal into an 880, and this is not something that was unusual in any other facility. But there have been instances where that hasn't happened. Um, some of you may remember this product, the LSM7 Live. This was a line scanning confocal. Um, and it was one of the least used pieces of equipment in our facility. And so it was, um, it was part of the initial lease program. It was one of the first microscopes that was here. And when it came up, 
to renew it, uh, we were having some discussions about what we should do with the system because there was really only one lab that was using it and it wasn't worth what we were paying in lease fees. Uh, thankfully, Zeiss made the decision for us because they discontinued the microscope. So there was no way to actually renew it. Um, it turned out that this was around the same time that uh, the light, Zeiss light sheet was released. So it was an easy transition for us. Um, we could make the move from the seven live to the light sheet. But for that one lab that was relying on that microscope, it was a really difficult transition. Um, it, it was amazing that they had this one ideal experiment for that microscope um, that just didn't work on any other system. Uh, so this can be an issue and this can be a problem and something that you might have to deal with in, in a least based environment. Great, so that's everything I, I, I wanted to talk to you about today. So I'll just kind of leave you with this summary. Um, I feel that leasing allows you to keep up with the rap, rapid technological advances in microscopy. We know that um, things are moving at a, at a really rapid rate right now. And this allows you to keep in step with that. Um, it allows you to maintain a consistent equipment budget from year to year. There's no surprises if something breaks down or if you need to buy a new microscope. We can adapt your equipment to your user base, both technique wise as well as usage wise. And it reduces a lot of risks, especially those associated with equipment failure and downtime. The one thing it certainly doesn't do is it's, uh, it's not going to save you money. Um, so, but it's also not going to be that much more or it should be fairly equivalent. So um, just by way of acknowledgement, I'd, I'd like to thank Yipeng Wang. She's a graduate student at the MIT Sloan School of Management. Um, she was really essential to this project. Um, she <laughs> lends it a lot of credibility on the business side. So I promise you everything I say today has been vetted by Yipeng and her supervisor uh, as being financially sound. Um, and if you are interested in reading or, or learning some more about this, um, we published a Science and Society article that's open access in EMBO reports earlier this year. Uh, and you can get into some, some more of the details there. Um, and other than that, thank you so much for your attention. Happy to discuss or take any questions that, that you might have. Thanks, Doc. That was super interesting. I have at least three questions, but I guess other people also have questions. I try if you stop sharing, then maybe it's easier to to see all the people. Yes, thanks. Perfect. So, well, um, yeah, Martin, Martin, raise his hand, please. Okay, uh, a very interesting talk because I thought of this uh, thought tool is try to think through it before, and it is a difficult topic because I don't have any experience. But my conclusion was pretty much the opposite. And the reason is your assumptions were based on you pay for everything, for purchase and maintenance. And I just quickly drafted an alternative version of your slide, which I just sent a link to the data share. And that is, just a moment, need to look at my, Open it myself. Um, if you leave the first bar away, the purchase, which is usually in most cases paid by someone else through a grant or whatever uh, external source, then suddenly the picture is very different. So the lease is much more expensive than purchasing if I don't have to actually buy the instrument. Uh, and the other thing is, uh, which uh, it makes a lot of sense in the business world and not for us. And one of the big reasons in my view is that I cannot accumulate money and save it for later. So uh, at the end of the financial year, they do the bills across the Institute. And if, if I have more money than I need, then it goes somewhere else. So if I buy a service contract, maybe even for two, three years, my money, in my experience, sometimes the money can be safer with Zeiss or Leica or someone than with your own institution. So that was my contribution. Thanks. Yeah. So I see a lot of questions coming up. So quick answer to this. 
<laughs> yeah, so I, I, I totally agree with you. Um, the, the one thing that I will say is um, if you are 100% successful with your grant applications, then yeah, great system. Um, if you're in a competitive environment where that's a little more difficult, uh, then there's a lot of timing issues and things like that, but like come into play. But it, the one thing that I think is the perfect solution to this is like granting bodies start supporting leasing as opposed to purchasing. And so if NIH or somebody would let me apply for a grant that would cover my lease, I'd be in the perfect situation at that point. Um, so I think that's, um, that would be the ideal. Okay, I've seen uh, Sebastian Buntu raising his hand. So you want to say something? Yes, I actually have a couple of questions and comments, uh, but maybe I'll start small. So my feeling was from the, uh, from the talk you gave that essentially there was no good estimate about the costs of switching the systems. So from our experience, basically in the first two, one to two years, we already have a much higher downtime of the systems. We have uh, more time that we need to spend on, uh, on repair. We always need to spend quite a lot of time for our uh, staff to integrate the new system. Maybe we have to spend some time on uh, or money on infrastructure that needs to be changed. So um, can you comment on that maybe? Yeah, sure. So I think um, there, there's a couple things that are helpful here. So one is the design of our mm -hmm. facility. So our facility was designed as a, um, an open concept facility. So it's just one big open room. So if you bring in a microscope, let suddenly the optical table doubles in size, that's uh, not a problem. We just shift things around in the room. So we're not having to do room construction or anything like that between systems, which is really helpful. The other thing is if, if you're doing a lease through a sole supplier like we are, um, in general, your software is always the same or very similar. So what this means is um, sort of on two levels, you can think of this. If I have a user that's been trained on one microscope and they've become an expert on that system, they want to move to, um, let's say they've been using a wide field system, they want to use to move to a confocal. Although the software has some differences in it, it's still very similar. So our training becomes much easier for users who want to use multiple instruments. And same thing when you're refreshing and re um, replacing an instrument, that software training, it's still, it's the same company, it's, it's the same software, although it's a newer version. Um, that all goes a little bit quicker. Um, so overall, I don't find that this idea of um, systems constantly turning over every three years has been a huge burden to us as far as um, building out space or anything like that. Uh, the worst has been that every system comes with a different power plug. So changing the outlet on the wall is, has been the, the, the most uh, sort of burdensome in that respect. Okay, there are some questions in the chat. So um, Sergi is asking whether leasing saves facility staff working time. And Stephanie says, no, leasing is only possible through tendering, which is time consuming. So is this, um, what about saving working time and leasing? Yeah, so um, as far as working time, so one big save in staff working time is we have an extra staff member included in our lease. Um, so that's definitely saved Harvard staff working time because we now have uh, a Zeiss staff member who can help us out with some of that work. Um, I think the big, um thing on our side is well not having to write grants for instruments right now because we can't because there's no funding possibility for that um and then what i mentioned earlier about training because everything is using the same software package training is users on multiple instruments um is a lot easier um as far as the the tendering process uh yeah, it's really time consuming at first. When you originally set up the system, uh, it took a lot of people at the university a lot of time. Um, it was a multi-year process to get this set up. Um, 
now we do four meetings a year that are about two hours each with Zeiss and Harvard people in the same room, um, just to make sure that we're all on the same page and things are working out well. Um, and we're not going through that tendering process with every microscope now. Um, so if we want to replace a system, all I do is uh, Zeiss sends us a configuration. We go back and forth a couple of times with that configuration. Once we're happy with it, they send us a quote. We produce a purchase order. The microscope shows up four to six months later. Um, so it's not that we have to go through, because this program is already in place, it's not that we have to go get quotes from like a Nikon Olympus um, each time we go to replace an instrument. Okay, so connected to this, there's another question from the chat. How is Zeiss Germany handling that? Does anyone have experience with this already? <laughs> yeah, so that's a good question. Um, so Zeiss North America, who we deal with, is very different than Zeiss Germany. Um, so Zeiss North America is a for-profit organization. That's a subsidiary of Zeiss Germany. They essentially buy the products from Zeiss Germany and then lease them to us. Um, so it's very different than what you would go through in Germany. Um, there's only one other institute that I know that is doing something similar to us. So um, an institute in Portugal just set up an evergreen program um, earlier this year. Um, and again, that would be something similar as well because it's external to Germany. Uh, that said, Germany is very familiar with this um, because they still hear all of our complaints and um, praises as well, um, both ways. So uh, they definitely know about the program. I don't think Zeiss Germany has been as, um, has made an effort to publicize it. I know Zeiss North America tried really hard for about five years after our facility opened to try and get other people around here to do it. And uh, no one no one did. So um, they kind of gave up on it at that point. So there was a question of, from Miju. So I think maybe this is the last question because we have to then ch change Zoom, Zoom meetings. So we need some time to lock onto the next Zoom meeting for the members. <laughs> so Mishu. Okay, thank you. Thank you for this really interesting idea. I think you, you already began uh, addressing this aspect. Um, I, I was wondering whether you could just briefly discuss a little bit more about the transition period, you know, where you have, you know, those people from one system transition to the next. And, and it, it, can you discuss this also in terms of data reproducibility? I mean, what happens when people have to sort of interrupt an experimental um, sequence? Um, and then jump from one system to the next. And I mean, do you establish protocols um, for how to do this well? Yeah, so um, we, I wouldn't say there's an official protocol to it, but um, essentially what happens is about a month before a system's about to be replaced, we notify everybody. And usually the biggest concern is making sure that everyone gets all their data off the computer, anything that's there. Um, as far as reproducibility goes, as long as we're not making a dramatic shift, like, like the one I described from the seven live to a light sheet, um, because Zeiss owns the systems, they are in here constantly doing checks on detectors, laser intensities, things like that. So I'm very confident that um, from system to system, we're not gonna get a, a massive dramatic change in those. Now, there are some things like, for example, right now, um, we went from an 880 to a 980. And so we've gone from argon gas lasers to diode lasers and the diode lasers are far more powerful. Um, so there's certainly been some compensation that we've had to do there. And we know our laser power measurements on the system that went out, we do them on the system that comes in. And so we can give people at least a ballpark. Um, it's not perfect. Um, that said, I think somewhat due to the nature of what we're doing here and let it's large three-dimensional tissue work and not super quantitative cell biology, um, that difference in laser power often isn't a big deal because when we're imaging thick tissue, we're changing our laser power as we image through it anyway. 
Um, so I'd say a lot of what we do here isn't um, super quantitative in an intensity sense, which would be my biggest concern with, with going from system to system. Okay, so um, I think we could, this discussion could go on and on and it's super interesting, but I think my impression is you're really lucky with size and you're implanted or with embedded, <laughs> embedded um, size scientists. So that's a big advantage, I, I think. Um, so I think it's, uh, well, um, the idea was how to, how to continue here. So I think it's, so maybe we can discuss so maybe you send uh, your, your questions to us and we can transfer them to Doug and we can continue ch chatting on other channels maybe. And or if somebody really seriously thinks about it, um, I'm sure you're open for advice and um, telling or consulting people maybe a bit, I hope. <laughs> yeah, no, for sure. Just whatever works for you. If you wanna put it all together and send it to me or if people just wanna maybe contact that's, me directly, so that's, that's fine too. It's a just, it's a very interesting concept. Uh, I, I was never thinking about this, but now I start thinking about this. It's so very interesting. And um, so uh, that's now the end of the first public part of our kickoff meeting. So I want to really thank all the audience for, I mean, it's many people, 52, for attending here. And it's very nice to, to, to have such a big first meeting. I hope you liked it. And I think it's, it was very useful to have you here, Doug. So it's a very, very good idea. And um, I hope we can continue either with journal clubs or other meetings and um, have more discussions on these things which are really concerning core units. So thank you very much, all of you. And goodbye. Uh, by the way, you can save the chat. You can always save the chat. So <laughs> see you. Bye-bye. Thank you a lot, Doug. <laughs> no problem. Thank you. Bye -bye. See you later. <laughs>